And I'm Bill Doley from Archaeology Southwest. Uh, we do preservation archaeology across the uh, Southwest, and we've been honored to work with Richard and Shirley Flint. Uh, Richard's going to be the speaker tonight, but uh, Richard and Shirley are a most amazing pair of researchers. Uh, there are few people that are so more committed to a subject than what they've committed their lives to in terms of pursuing uh, understanding and documenting the Coronado expedition, all of the other implications of that t particular time period. And as a result of the historical work that they've done, uh, the opportunity to think about how their historical documents relate to the what may be on the ground or uh, so on is uh, something they've also thought greatly about. So tonight um, we'll turn things over to Richard where where pen meets trowel, um, and go for it, Richard. Thank you for thank, coming to Tucson. Uh, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here again. Those of you who saw the announcement of this talk uh, read the title. It's a long title. And there are, in fact, two, two semicolons, two colons <laughs> in the title. So, so you've got a preliminary title. Oh, got to explain that. So we have colon, explain that, that we're talking about two disciplines, history and archaeology. Then we've got to have a colon because we got now, what are we talking about, those two disciplines? And the answer is we're talking about the use and um, basis for talking about cause and effect in the two disciplines as commonly practiced in the United States, I think. At least from our experience, I think Shirley's and my experience of having worked with quite a number of archaeologists in historical archaeological settings. When we were driving down to Tucson today, uh, I'm going to plug a book, not ours, uh, this is a former Tucson resident, Barbara King Solver. Uh, her latest book, Flight Behavior. Uh, you wouldn't think a book about butterflies would be all that riveting, but it truly is a neat book. And she said some interesting things in interesting ways in the book. And I'm just going to read right now to start off one sentence. Beyond all half-answers and evasions, one question had persisted since forever. And that is why. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And maybe before I get too far into it, I should say, this was this, a version, an earlier version of this talk was given as the uh, keynote address at the 2012, last year, uh, PICOS conference. And I got about 15 minutes, less than 15 minutes into the talk, and the electricity went out. <laughs> and it never came back. We're in a tent with the sun going down. I had a flashlight. And by well before the end of the talk, I could not see the audience at all. I didn't know if everybody had left <laughs> or whether, if I was alone. I, I mean, literally, I was up on a little dais, and I couldn't see a thing. It was just all black out there. And I'm hoping that tonight, both sort of metaphorically and physically, we're not all in the dark. So let me, let me begin. When pen meets trowel, and of course that's in a, a reference to the two disciplines that we're most concerned with tonight, or that I'm most concerned with tonight, history, basically the traditionally based on print, the printed word, not so much uh, exclusively anymore, and archaeology focused on 
illiterate or non-literate objects. That makes for a big difference. And we have worked with, as I say, a number of archaeologists on historical archaeology projects. Most times they go very well and smoothly. But there are always, I think, um, points at which we don't function well together. We do not, we bump up against each other, we're not going the same way. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight. Try to give an idea of, at least from the point of view of a couple of historians, uh, what we have seen that might indicate why some of those rough places happen, and maybe what can be done about them, what we can do to make those less rocky. The two disciplines are, and seem on the surface anyway, to be complementary to each other. Uh, and they frequently can be complementary. Uh, each, I would say if I was going to uh, characterize each of the disciplines, uh, shares a goal of study and explanation of past human behavior. So broadly speaking, we're after the same thing. The, maybe if we want to put it in one, in one little question, it is we're all out to answer why has the past unfolded the way it has. I mean, that's a very basic question. Uh, then we have specific instances of that past behavior that we address in specific projects, in specific writing, uh, and in specific thinking. The two disciplines, history and archaeology, have um, since, not from their beginning, but for a long time now in the United States, been considered distinct disciplines. Many of the uh, practitioners of both disciplines 150 to 100 years ago were doing both, and they didn't see any problem in doing that. They did, uh, they worked with documents, they worked with artifacts, they worked with the dirt, they worked with ideas. That did not seem to bother them. As the two disciplines have developed, though, we have closed each other off, one from the other. And that's partly been a function of sort of the academe, what happens in establishing turf in, a, in an academic setting, and partly because, and this is I think is the most important thing, partly because there are differences between the two, intrinsic differences between the two disciplines that mean that we are not, even though we can s sort of frame our questions in the same kind of way, that we are not looking for the same kinds of answers. Now, that's not to say that history and archaeology cannot work together. Individual practitioners do and will continue to. And in fact, in recent times, the last, say, couple of decades, there have been some dramatic instances in which each of the disciplines has been deployed sort of in the other's traditional territory with remarkable results. That's one example. Think of the revolution that has been caused by the insight that Mayan hieroglyphics are historical records, at least of a sort. They are elite historical records. And how that has radically changed the vision of prehistoric Maya society from once being envisioned as a, as a people that was obsessed 
with astronomical observation of the heavens. They were recording dates all the time. These stelly were recording dates after dates after dates, and it was a, considered to be calendrical. Just that. Then, beginning about in the 1970s, um, Tatyana Proskuryakov um, began the most uh, detailed work on the hieroglyphs and discovered that, in fact, they could be translated. They were words. It wasn't numbers and pictures. What the eff one of the major effects of the development of deciphering the hieroglyphics on Mayan stele has been to erase, to a certain extent, the dividing line between prehistoric Maya and modern Maya. Uh, they are all truly human now. Uh, they were only partly human when uh, the people of prehistory in the Maya region until then. Because it, we thought we saw that they were very, they were, they were, their interests were extraordinarily limited. They might have been exciting, but they were extraordinarily limited. And what deciphering the, the stele, the hieroglyphs on the stele showed was that in fact they were actually interested in a whole range of very recognizably modern topics. They were recording things like births and deaths, marriages, changes of regimes, wars, famines, all kinds of things that generally we imagine people are interested in. And so it's only natural that in fact those stelae record that kind of information. Now, it's interesting that it has revolutionized the study of Mayan archaeology, but I would say it has yet, that sort of revelation has yet to be incorporated into southwestern archaeology. Sort of the thirst to make the people of the past more human, more fully human, let me put it that way, has, I think, not percolated into other areas of archaeology, as I think probably it would be nice if it did. I think we would all be enriched if it, if it could, if it did. On the other hand, going the other way, the use of archaeology in historical subjects has also produced remarkable results in recent times. I think of, I think of several things. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with uh, the quite intense study that has been going on for uh, about two decades of the Comanche Wars in the Southern Plains in the US. Uh, but the study of battles that happened during the Comanche Wars has been revealed in the unbelievable detail because of the deployment of archaeological techniques and concepts. So for instance, in a particular battlefield in the Texas Panhandle, it was possible to, tra to trace individual military personnel, individual men, as they crossed the battlefield, knelt, reloaded, fired, moved on, knelt again, fired again, so that when you put this all together, you can actually see a whole bunch of individuals. It's no, it's no longer a mass event. It is, in fact, a whole group of individuals, and they're each reacting in their way, which is, I think, again, a way of humanizing making it more human, the event, which is otherwise portrayed as a two large groups confronting each other. Now we have an opportunity to look at it in a more, much more personal 
way. So these are, the, these are good examples. These are wonderful examples that, that have been, I think, of benefit to all of us who are interested in the past. I think, though, that even though both disciplines have greatly aided sort of the, the partner discipline, I think in, the, in each case, the uh, sort of the, a commitment to incorporating that other discipline in a more general way, in a routine way, has not happened. Does not happen. We don't get projects in which you have co-principal investigators one a historian and one an archaeologist, each pursuing a set of questions that are meaningful within that person's own discipline. What in fact usually seems to happen is that we have one principal discipline and one sort of handmaiden discipline when there is an attempt at collaboration. In which case, the principal, the practitioner of the principal discipline, takes what seems relevant from the corresponding discipline and sort of tacks it on to his or her own particular research. Sometimes, often, I think, often, sort of taking for granted that what is sort of cherry-picked from that other discipline is sort of permanent. Somehow the other discipline has, it can be viewed as having completed its work. It's finished. It's got, it's got end products that are never going to change. So we, we can now count on those historical facts, for instance. They can be put in as a historical background that will help round out the archaeological findings. Or, in the case of a historical project, we get the opposite effect. We get the uh, sort of his we get the archaeological context, which is a very quick overview of what is taken, I think, by the often by the principal researcher as again fact. Un alterable, unchanging fact. Even though practitioners in both disciplines know that their own discipline is changing all the time, the findings of their discipline are shifting from almost day to day. In fact, in the case of virtually any truly uh, conscientious and dedicated scholar, that's bound to happen. And it is, I think, until, until we can incorporate the two disciplines on equal footing, with equal footing, in projects, we won't really reap the benefit of the synergy that is, in fact, possible. It truly can produce much more than the sum of the two if, in fact, each is given equal weight. Now, sort of the the point of, of talking uh, to you tonight is to examine disciplinary assumptions. So assumptions that are, well, we can't call them universal because there's clearly a wide range of variation among practitioners in both fields. There are, did I lose it again? No, okay. Uh, but there clearly are very frequent assumptions that are common to practitioners in each of the two fields, archaeology and history. The, maybe it's, maybe I should, I, I should say a little bit about why I'm even interested in talking. When I was an undergraduate, um, I thought that uh, what I was going to pursue 
as a career was uh, studying the philosophy of science. That was the field that was of most interest to me. And a particular part of philosophy of science, what, what one might call uh, metaphysics in, the, in a basic sense, um, was, this, was the subject of cause, how people determine that one thing causes another thing, and what assumptions we make in doing that, what criteria uh, will meet our expectations so that we then say that such and such happened because such and such happened. And that has remained an interest of mine even as a historian. It because for me, and I think for many in both fields, that question is really central to our interest in the subject to begin with, in our subjects to begin with. We want to know why things happen. We don't want to just describe what happened. We want to be able to give an idea in a reasonable way a way that we feel satisfied with, and that perhaps others will be satisfied with, as to why things happened the way they did. So, I think one of, one of, the, one of the insights I had long, long ago was that when we ask that question, why, and I don't mean within a discipline, I just mean basically ask the question why of anything. We do not always expect the same answer or even the same kind of answer to that question. It varies with the subject, with the circumstances, and I would say with the discipline. There are disciplinary habits of thinking that lead practitioners to look for certain kinds of explanations that are not common to people in the other partner discipline. And I think that that is, in essence, what I want to say tonight. What I want, I hope that I am able to communicate tonight, is that I think that that is a very important condition. And it is, I think, one important, but only one, uh, important ingredient in why, when we try, and we do try, uh, to work collaboratively between the two disciplines, why too often we are disappointed, we are frustrated, we feel like we're n one or the other feels, or both, feel like we're not being appreciated. We're just doing some grunt work for the other discipline. Um, and it is, I think, in part, and in an important part, because of this issue of how we each, as groups, choose to answer those question of why. Let me give a very, very, very uh, basic example. Um, when I was a grad student at uh, UNM, I got in the habit of parking in one particular place on a uh, side street off campus because I could get free, it was free parking there. And then I'd walk to class from there. And the, on this one street, it had been, the houses had been built in the 1930s, and the vegetation had been planted about the same time, um, and it had grown up and was very mature. So the sidewalks in this neighborhood, many of them were buckled by big roots now. You know, the trees had grown up, they were full. The sidewalk was buckled in a number of places. And one day, I got out of my car, and I, like I say, I've been parking virtually the same exact spot, day after day after day after day. 
without mishap. But on this particular day, I stumbled and went full face down on the sidewalk. I had tripped over a place where the root had pushed up two different pieces of concrete sidewalk, and there was now a space between them. They were at the same height, and I caught one. And the question is, why did it happen? Why did it happen? And there are lots of things we can answer to that question. One is the, what we've already said. The tree grew up, broke the sidewalk, end of story. And I say, no, it's not good enough. That's not good enough. I've been, I've been parking here every day, every day, every day. I didn't trip yesterday. I didn't trip the day before. Could I have gone on every day from here on out and never have tripped? Was it something I did? Was I tired? Was I distracted? Was I angry? Was, was there something that was completely unrelated, really, to the sidewalk? I might have tripped on a flat surface. So what the question is not just what were the material causes that made me fall? What, what, what caused the sidewalk to rise? Because there were more ingredients in this stumble than that. There was me. And what did I do? And there are all kinds of things that may have happened. Or there are other ingredients beyond that. There's a larger environment. Was there something slippery? Was the tree shedding something as a product of its growth that made the sidewalk slippery? These are all kinds of things that might be considered as relevant to answering that question of why did I trip? And when we look at more serious issues, we have the same problems. We have the same problems. So, for instance, if we, are, if we were to look at um, something as uh, probably well known, uh, in New Mexico, among the Pueblo people in New Mexico, there was a major event that happened in the year of 1680. It's known as the Pueblo Revolt among some people. And among others, it's called the Pueblo-Spanish War. It was, at any rate, the beginning of a great violence between the two groups in New Mexico that ultimately resulted in the expulsion or killing of the entire Hispanic population of New Mexico. It ended Spanish sovereignty in New Mexico for a time. Why did it happen? Archaeologists will tend to look at it in this way, the ones I know. They will say that the region had been suffering increasingly severe droughts throughout the 1660s and 1670s. And that was a major cause. And there was, there was a lot of stress among all the people. And that, that was a major ingredient in why the Pueblo people rose up against their Spanish overlords. They may go on to say that there were other reasons too, sort of a generalized friction between the two groups that was of long standing, religious intolerance in a, in a a uh, very generalized way, and that these all would come together to make for an uprising, an uprising. Now I talk to my historian friends, and what do they say? Well, they will admit that there was drought. They will admit that there was drought, and that, that was probably making people feel bad. Um, they will say that in addition to that, and they think more importantly, they will say, more importantly, there was a particular individual, a man named Pope, who was a Pueblo leader from Taos Pueblo. 
and he had been imprisoned by the governor of New Mexico. He and several of his compatriots from Taos had been imprisoned and badly, badly treated, uh, tortured. We would, we would call it being tortured um, for a period of months and then released in 1679, the year before the uprising. And Pope, the man Pope, was considered to be one of the leaders of the uprising of the Pueblo Revolt. And they would say that fact outweighs those environmental causes. They would not say it eliminates them. They would say it outweighs them. If it had not been, they would say it's not sufficient to talk about drought because if we just talk about drought, why didn't it happen in 1670 instead of 1680? Or 1677? Or why didn't it wait till 1681? Or 82? Why did it happen in 1680? That is, a, that is a perfectly legitimate question. And it is one that is, uh, I think, historians feel they can answer. They can answer that part of the question. So, the question is, at this point, are we inevitably stuck in really two different approaches? And there is a certain amount of a yes answer to that question because archaeologists, by the very nature of the data that archaeologists, and I would have to count myself as a sometime archaeologist, I studied archaeology at the master's level, uh, so I have a great deal of uh, respect and empathy for archaeologists, and I hope a certain amount of understanding of where uh, my fellow academics and researchers come from. But the source of data for archaeology is such that it does not it does not deal with individual people. Ordinarily, it's very difficult to see individual people in, in the archaeological record, except in some very special cases. There are some historical archaeology contexts in which that is possible. I even talked about the one of the Comanche Wars. I mean, we, we're looking at individual fighters in that battle. That it is possible in some circumstances, but ordinarily that is not the case. In fact, as archaeologists, we are studying groups. We can only refine our explanatory um, statements to groups. Some, sometimes whole culture areas, we think, is, is the limit. And in addition to that, because we cannot look at individual people, we also are sort of barred uh, for the most part, now again there are exceptions, but for the most part we are barred from fine divisions of time. They're just not possible usually. The kind of, um, we can't usually get down to such things as historians sort of commonly come up with is knowing the day that something happened or sometimes even the hour of the day that something happened. That is virtually impossible for m in most uh, archaeological contexts. So it is, in fact, no wonder that the kinds of explanations that are uh, common for archaeologists are the kind that affect groups. And the kind that affect groups. So no wonder we talk about large environmental causes. This is something that we're not, we're not working at, the, at an individ, individual level. We're working at a 
group level over a fairly significant amount of time, what kind of, what kind of forces can we see at play over that kind of, it, with those kinds of constraints? And it, so it is no wonder that things like drought, for instance, in the, in the example of the uh, Pueblo Revolt of 1680, are in fact favored and comfortable to archaeologists, whereas historians who deal with sort of packaged uh, data, it comes attached to people all the time, individual people, and sometimes it's, it's impossible to get away from those, it's, it's so fine-grained that the group disappears. We see a whole lot of individuals, we, we have a kind of chaos where all kinds of things are happening out there, and it's how, how do you just how do you see what is happening uh, to a we'll call it a cultural group? How do we see that as historians? We're not comfortable with the big with the big picture, generally speaking. There are again exceptions to this. There was a whole class of. Uh, mathematical historians, quantitative historians. For, for a period of time, especially in the 1970s, uh, it became quite fashionable for uh, historians to collect masses of data and treat them in a statistical way rather than looking at individuals at all. And uh, part, of the, part of the reason for that, and I think this is a place where there is a sharing of motive uh, between uh, historians and archaeologists is that part of the reason for that was that there was a big push across academia to be, if you can't be a scientist, be like a scientist. And this was deemed to be being like a scientist. It becomes something you can measure, something you can manipulate, in a mathematical way, and it does tell you things. I mean, it, it, it's, not as, it's not phony. I mean, it does, it does in fact tell you things. It's not the same things that historians were traditionally used to, and there was a lot of resistance among more, sort of more traditional historians about doing this, but it did for a while uh, put uh, those historians who practiced history in that way uh, put them in a, in a way more compatible with at least the mindset of um, what I would say many archaeologists have. Um, so what do we do? Um, we suffer, we suffer. Uh, I think I think that, and and we we certainly are. We're not going to. Nobody's going to stop. Nobody's going to stop, and we're and we're not going to stop uh, trying to collaborate. And there will be very successful collaborations. Uh, there will continue to be. But I think that until we actually can, I think each admit that the kind of explanations each of us produces is only partial. It is really not complete. In other words, it really does take two different major kinds of cause. One that we would call, uh, that I'm going to call, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to call latent causal conditions. That's the kind of thing like the tree root pushing up the sidewalk. It's something that does not by itself cause anything, but it lays the groundwork for something. And secondly, what I would call a precipitating cause. And this is much more what we are used to as historians, a very more personalized kind of uh, aspect of cause, where in fact individual people are important it didn't have to turn out the way it did if there hadn't been individual actions 
at some point, leading to a consequence. The sidewalk could have been cracked forever, and if I didn't come along and do contribute my part, there was not going to be a stumble. And if we can say that, if we can re say that and mean it, that in fact we need each other, then I think it becomes much more likely that we can have satisfactory and rewarding, even, uh, collaborations. Now, there is all, both disciplines are going to go on. They're just going to go on. It, they, 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 they don't stop. And things are going to change. Our, our vision of the past in both aspects, archaeology and history, are going to continue. And they're go we're going to evolve, perhaps on parallel lines. But I would say if we can make it a sort of a co-evolution, if we can be doing it together, I think we're in for a better result. And I would hope that more and more in the future we can do that. But I think we can only do it if we actually realize that there is in fact a problem if we don't. And it hurts both of us if we don't. So that's what I want to say tonight. And we can have questions, we can talk about this, I'm sure, endlessly. But and this is this is not intended to be by any means a whole picture. It's not even supposed to say all the things, all the sort of disagreements and and hard places that we have with each other as other disciplines. This, but this is a major one, I think, and it's one that we don't look at. It's part of each of our cultures, and we're inside. Sometimes it is painfully obvious to the person in, the, in the, sort of the opposite uh, discipline. What is needed by the other person, very hard to see what you yourself need. And if we can become convinced that we do each need the other aspect, I think we will all benefit. So, thanks. Please, then. So, obviously, your experience, you and Charlie, with the Coronado work has led you to make these comments tonight. So, would you like to take those comments and apply them a little more specifically to the work you've been doing? How has archaeology and history come together or not come together? In your the, yes, sure. I mean, I, th I th that, that's, that's definitely a, uh, a big question. Sure. Okay. In case, yeah, in case you didn't hear, uh, Dan was asking, uh, suggesting, and, and rightly, that uh, these observations have come from Shirley's and my own experience in uh, working in collaborative settings uh, with regard to the Coronado expedition, and that is certainly true. That that is actually not the only context in which that has happened, but um, it has certainly been a major one. Uh, for about um, something over a decade, uh, we were uh, intimately and regularly involved in an, what was dominantly an archaeological project in the Texas South Plains uh, at a site that is now known as the Jimmy Owens site. It, it is a uh, site where the Coronado Exhibition camped in the year 1541. Um, it was discovered in 1993, and uh, we are happy to say that we were part of the actual identification of the site. And uh, so it was, it was a very exciting uh, occurrence. Uh, it does not happen at all every day. Uh, so it was remarkable. But I think that what, what we found, what we found, was that uh, very commonly, and there were a number of archaeologists involved, uh, 
there was a, a principal investigator, but there were a number of other people who participated in major ways in the uh, investigation of the Jimmy Owens site. And uh, I gave the example, or I, I mentioned, uh, not, I didn't really give an example, but I, I, I mentioned earlier that I think one of the problems uh, that, that comes up between uh, people in the two disciplines is we each assume that the other, the other's uh, discipline has a whole set of sort of cut and dried facts that they have access to. And they can just spit them out. We just add, we can just look it up. Or they can look it up. They, they know where to look it up. They can look it up and they can, so we can just ask the question. They can go look it up and they can tell us what the answer is. So if we're a historian, we have an archaeological question or we think it's an archaeological question. We ask an archaeologist and they're expected to, well, come on. Certainly, certainly, certainly you all know this. It's, it can't be that hard. You got to know it. You just tell it. And if you don't tell it, it means you're holding back. It means you're not cooperating. You know, you, you don't want to be in the pro project. So just, just, as, just as a funny kind of example, in, in, the, in that particular case, in the, in the case of uh, the Jimmy Owen site, uh, because there were not very many historians involved in, in the work, um, Shirley and I were frequently asked questions by historians. And the, traditionally, the study of the Coronado Expedition has been largely document-based. Document there are a series of uh, documents, actually it's an increasingly large series of documents, but uh, a finite group of documents that uh, at least give information about the Coronado expedition. So I remember being reproached one time by a not 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 a um, not a senior uh, archaeologist, but a student archaeologist, a graduate student, and um, he asked, "Whatever happened to the sea nets?" And I said, "What sea nets?" He said, you know, the sea nets that they talk about in the Winship translation of uh, one of the documents. And I said, well, I have to go back and look at that. I, I, I have no idea <laughs> what happened to, to, to the sea to the nets. Well, that evening or the following evening, we did get back to the Winship translation of the that particular document, I believe it was the Peter de Castaneda, the uh, long narrative, the, the longest document that we have that tells about the Coronado expedition. And we're able to compare it with the, uh, with a um, Xerox copy of the actual original Spanish document. And found out that George Parker Wimship, who had done the translation back in 1896, had just made a mistake. He had translated a word wrong. I mean dead wrong. It did not mean anything about sea nets. There was a there wasn't there was an element in the word. There was an element in the Spanish word red, R E D, which does mean net. Which does mean net. But in this case it was an adjective meaning all tangled up. It was not a noun even, but Winship had translated it as a noun, and there was so this was one of the this was one of the potential objects that was being according to this translation that the Coronado expedition might have been carrying these sea nets. <laughs> it's like, and it just simply wasn't not true, not true. But here is a case here is a case where one assumed that. Because, it, because the book existed and the translation had been done, it was correct and it was something worth knowing. Neither of which were true. Neither of which were true. And so those kinds of things are the, are the kinds of things that we ran up a lot, against a lot. Now, I would say in a more general way, uh, one of the things that we regretted, I think, in the process of the exploration of the Jimmy Owen site was that funding for research at the Jimmy Owen site 
was all on the archaeology side. And for those of you, even though I know archaeologists complain about funding, but you ought to see history funding. <laughs> because the National Science Foundation, for instance, is funded at about 20 times the volume of funding of the National Endowment for the Humanities, for instance. There simply is nowhere near the kind of resource available for historical research. And what we say is too bad. We, we, did, we did, and we didn't push for it at this point. We, so we don't, we can't blame others. We're, we're just saying that it wasn't even thought about at the time, that maybe it would be a good idea to do, why don't, couldn't some documentary research maybe be a component of this research, this general research into the Jimmy Owen site? Might it contribute to the overall knowledge of the Coronado expedition? Isn't it worth doing both? And so often, it doesn't occur to anybody that that would be even appropriate to do. It's it's you know no I I, I thought of the I thought of, I I am at I say an archaeologist I as the archaeologist I'm the one who designed this thing it's my project I I'm asking the questions um, you know it's an archaeology project. Well, yeah, it can be. It can be exclusively an archaeology pro project. But I think what I'm sort of asking is, can we look at it in a different way and say that we can make it richer if we also try our best to include in historical context? I mean, there are limits to what, you know, we're not going to suggest that, that um, historians be added to prehistoric archaeology uh, projects, unless there's some real compelling reason. But certainly in the case of historic projects, why not? And, boy, you'd make a lot of historians happy. <laughs> and, and I think, and I think there, there would, some really good relationships can be improved even more. And we will learn more if we do that. So, those are the kinds of, um, and that, that's only beginning to touch the various ways in which I think we have felt like, um, you know, from sort of historian point of view, how we were definitely handmaidens. We were there to answer certain specific kinds of questions, and that was all. Uh, because there wasn't anything new that was going to be found out in the history department. You know, that, that was all said and done. We, we, we couldn't say anything new. Yeah, Bill. At the beginning you talked about um, the fundamental questions for history and archaeology and why did this happen. And I'm wondering, have, have there been periods when people were more prone to question whether that question has any real meaning. And here I am coming at this from in, in my other life <laughs> the being about, a scientist. about asteroid impacts. Yeah. You, know, you know, okay, this civilization might have been, these dinosaurs might have been destroyed by, that's why they should. But then if you ask, well, why did that hit? Of course, that doesn't have much of an answer. I mean, you could say, well, because three hours before it was headed in that direction. <laughs> 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 that's not very satisfying. So, um, so, I mean, it was a random event, and that's the kind of thing I'm yes. troubled by. Well, and, and there certainly are those cases. I'm not, I do not want to even uh, begin to imply that every single situation has a sort of purposeful element but to it. But, well, I think... I, th I think, I'm not sure if it's better or worse, but uh, in the 19th and early 20th century, in generally, uh, again, exceptions existed, but generally speaking, 
in the history field, it was thought to be simply descriptive. Just tell us what happened. In order. That, that, that is your job. Tell us what happened in order. And if you can, make it interesting, because otherwise class is deadly boring. So there was a whole long period when there, when there wasn't much thought given to why. That was, that was really sort of outside the bounds of what was considered appropriate for historians to even do. And I think that for myself, I know that during my particular career, I know that the question, the questions why, and why now, and why there, have been very important. They have been, without that, without that, without asking those questions, and hoping that one can develop at least the beginnings of plausible answers to those questions, it wasn't, it wasn't anything I wanted to pursue. I wasn't interested in saying what happened and in what order. That, that is not interesting to me. And uh, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not answering your question because I'm not talking about the field in a general way. Um, there are certainly times when it does seem inappropriate, perhaps, to ask why. When, when it is, when the events that we're talking about are the kind that, you're, that you brought up, where you have truly, totally material causes going on. There is, there is no other aspect to it. You know, and, and I certainly think that that's true. But for myself, and th I think for the generation of historians that I work among, it would be considered that if you didn't consider those questions, if you didn't pose them, if you didn't make an effort to bring data to bear on those questions, you're not doing the job. You're not doing the job. Yeah. Richard, yeah. Um, it seems to me there's some other things that happen too, generational, regionally, and that sometimes things come up on a more mundane level. Let me give you an example. Sure. Buddy Fontana, who I think most everybody here knows. Yeah. I was talking with him one day, he was talking about when he taught beginning archaeology that he would throw a bunch of artifacts on the table and <clears throat> say to the students, okay, come up, gather around, and tell me what, what are they? So they would come up, and they would pick them up, and they would move them with their hands, and they would say, oh, yeah, that, that, that's probably a scraper. Then he said the next generation of students that he taught, he would ask them to come up, and they would stand around with their hands behind their back and look at the art and try to guess what they were used for. And the difference in the generations was that the first generation, and they were almost the all male, there were not only women, very few women, sure. Adults, sure. had come from farms. And they were used to using their hands. And they were used to using tools. Mm -hmm. And the next generation did not come from the farms. And they had no sense of use of the hands that way. So they came up with an entirely different set of answers. Yeah. Compared to the first generation. I think that's a neat, neat, neat example. Because it, it is the kind of thing that we're up against, I think. It's, it's things that we don't think about. It's things that we come with. You know, we're, we're, already, we're already in that mode when we enter into a discipline. You know, we have certain kinds of assumptions, certain kinds of ways of behaving that are truly, we can really call them cultural and that they are largely invisible to us. And we can sometimes get away from them, inch away from them. It's almost impossible to leave them behind. Yeah. Dan. I was just thinking about other interdisciplinary things that are related. You just sure. Two 
That's right. Genetics and the people who study teeth and linguists and all kinds of people that can come together uh, for studying some of these things. And each of them brings these other kinds of perspectives. Probably the outcome is good. I, I, th I couldn't agree more. We were just, we were just spending uh, yesterday and last night with a geologist friend who has gotten very heavily involved in several archaeological projects. And it has been fascinating to watch because he has brought a, a very different perspective to those particular projects and an angle that wasn't being considered at all. Something as simple as where was the river at the time that this event that you're talking about took place? Where was it? Where was it flowing? Was it right here next to this Pueblo? Was it four miles away? Because it could have been. It's migrated back and forth across this great floodplain countless times. Where was it? And wouldn't that maybe have a an impact on what you think happened here. And absolutely. So it, it is not limited, absolutely not limited to historians and archaeologists. I think we, we, are, we happen to be uh, two disciplines that do reasonably frequently already try to work together. And I think that, yes, I, th I think that it would be richer the more the merrier really, uh, and, the, and the better the final outcome would be, as long as, and this is the caveat, I think it's still the caveat, as long as each is incorporated sort of on an equal footing and their work is important to them. It's not just important to the project, but it's important to them. They're vitally interested in the outcome of this project because the aspect that they're studying is, in fact, important in their world. Thank you, Light.